Thank you very much. I'm Anthony Zane. I'm, I'm an intensive care specialist from Royal North Shore. Um, I, like you do these days in talks, I'd first like to just note that I don't really have any financial disclosures, um, at least no scandals that I'm going to admit to at this point in time. Um, why, so why are we interested in levo -Semendin? We started looking at this, you know, some years ago now when it first was um, released. And it did, as Peter was saying, seem to be a wonder drug for patients with acute heart failure in that you could give patients an infusion of levo -Semendin for a for 24 hours and then over the next week they would continue to improve. Um, their inotropes would come off and they'd, they'd seem to make urine, they'd seem to get better from it. Um, unfortunately at the time that we looked at this, um, and we published this in the International Journal of Cardiology, there was really very little good evidence from large clinical trials to support that hypothesis. Um, and when you put together the trials at that time for patients with acute severe heart failure, you could find a weak signal that it seemed to be better than dobutamine um, but you couldn't find any consistent signal across the clinical trials that it was better than placebo, which raised an interesting question, which we went on to look at, and it did seem to be that dobutamine was associated with an increase in mortality in this particular group of patients. Um, and we thought at the time that maybe that's because this particular population of patients, you know, the most common cause of severe heart failure is underlying ischemic heart disease and dobutamine being a beta agonist, seem to increase myocardial oxygen consumption, more likely to have arrhythmias and the like. Um, this was updated, and I haven't gone through that ourselves, but it was updated just in January this year by the Cochrane Collaboration that really came to the same conclusion, that for patients with acute severe heart failure, there is very little evidence, apart from that specific comparison to dobutamine, <coughs> to suggest that levosimendin is associated with better outcomes for patients with acute severe heart failure. Um, so then the question might be, are there specific indications where you might find a use for levosimendin? And again, this is a place where there has been some recent evidence from large clinical trials, both in the preoperative prophylactic setting for patients having high-risk cardiac surgery, um, in the setting for patients with high-risk cardiac surgery, both as a prophylactic and a rescue measure, and also for patients who have um, a reasonably common problem in intensive care who might have myocardial, acute myocardial dysfunction related to severe sepsis. Um, and there have been three large trials um, in, in cardiac surgery in the first little while, which we'll briefly touch upon. Um, the first was published in JAMA in the middle of last year, where, uh, which was called Lycorn. I don't, I don't know why they didn't go for Lion, because Lion fits better with some of the other big cat analogies they've used for acronyms for these trials. Um, and this was done in 13 French cardiac centres for patients having on-pump coronary artery bypass graft surgery, where the only real risk factor was having a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 40% preoperatively. And they gave their levosimendin, pretty much as we do, as an infusion of 0.1 mics per kilo for 24 hours, without a losing dose, given after the induction of anaesthesia, but prior to the cardiac surgery. Um, quite cleverly, as anyone who's used levo knows, it comes as a sort of yellow colour in the bag, and so these guys used a vitamin infusion as their... Um, as their placebo to ensure blinding for the trial. Um, and as all of these trials have done, it, it's pretty hard to do mortality-based trials in this particular population because the mortality tends to be fairly low. So they used a composite outcome of the requirement for a, a persistent catecholamine infusion, the requirement for either persistent or new mechanical assist devices for left ventricular support postoperatively, or the institution of renal replacement therapy. Um, and in the internal validity, they really did a good... I won't go through it because we don't really have time today, but they did a very good job with the trial. Um, and what did they find? They found no difference. You know, as you might expect, uh, the requirement for inotropes maybe was a little bit less in the post-operative period, but really there was no difference in mortality and there was no difference in any of the other clinical outcomes measured for the patients that received dobutamine versus the patients that received a vitamin infusion. Um, the next trial is very much in a very similar vein, published in the New England Journal again in the middle of last year, and it was done in 70 centres across the US and Canada. So that the inclusion criteria are a little bit more broad in that you could not only have coronary artery surgery, but maybe with mitral valve surgery or mixed coronary artery and valve surgery. And the patients are probably a little bit sicker with a slightly lower ejection fraction. Um, they use levosmin in a very similar way with a small loading dose of 0.2 mics per kilo for an hour followed by an infusion for 23 hours. They used a matching placebo, 
and they've got a magical uh, combined outcome of two co-primary outcomes with four composite endpoints in one and two composite endpoints in the other. Um, again, to try and get the event numbers up to something where you might be able to measure a difference between the two groups. Mm. Once again, as you might expect from a, a study published in one of the major medical magazines, it, the internal validity was pretty good. Again, what did they find? Well, I suppose they found that the, the pharmacological basis of, of why we might choose to lose levosimendi would seem to be confirmed in that they had less patients afterwards who had a low cardiac output syndrome, which is defined by low cardiac indexes measured or, again, the need for persistent inotrope infusions. And they also found a smaller proportion of patients who required a prolonged infusion of inotropes. But again, they found no difference in, in any of the major clinical outcomes, either as the composites or as the individual components of those outcomes. So again, it's, it's one, of those, one of those instances which we see reasonably commonly, at least in the intensive care literature, where you can see improvements in a surrogate outcome with seeing improvements in the major patient-focused clinical outcomes. Finally, a group of uh, Italian investigators and who worked with some people in Brazil and Russia managed to turn that trial's name into the acronym of CHEETA, which does require some contortions or a grasp, grasp of the Italian language that's beyond me. Um, they performed a trial, again, in probably a sicker population where the, the medication in this circumstance wasn't used simply as prophylaxis, but also as rescue therapy. So 14 centres across Italy, Russia and Brazil, patients having cardiac surgery or subsequently used in the intensive care unit, and you either had to have a pre-op rejection fraction of less than 25%, a pre-op requirement or preoperatively receiving an intraoperative intra-aortic balloon counterpulsation, or postoperatively you seem to be failing from low cardiac output syndrome and you required an intra-aortic intra balloon counterpulsation or high-dose vasopressors. The infusion, the levosimine again is used in a standard fashion with you know, 0.05 to 0.2 mics per kilo per minute and, and about 80% of them are getting 0.1 mics per kilo per minute. Could be continued up for 48 hours, which is slightly different. And again, they use the vitamins and, as their comparison group. But in this trial, they're measuring specifically a patient-centered outcome, which is 30-day mortality. And again, I, it's pretty hard to find fault with the major determinants of internal validity of the trial. And once again, they, they found essentially no difference in any of the outcomes. Now, it may be notable for an audience here in Australia that the mortality rates are much higher than we might expect for a high-risk cardiac surgical population in our country. We're probably looking at less than 5% mortality rather than a 12 or 13% mortality. But again, there was no difference between the two groups. So I think with regards to updating the evidence and what we would currently think, there is probably no real indication for levosimend in the high-risk cardiac surgery patients. With, with regards specifically to improving any um, measurable, important patient-centred outcome. So what about in sepsis? And in sepsis, I'd, I'd have to say I'm not so sure that it's the same problem in that while septic cardiomyopathy is a problem, patients tend not to die from it as much as they would die from refractory vasoplegia. And I'm not sure that levosimendin is particularly the drug that's going to help you with refractory vasoplegia. Um, but in the LEOPARDS trial, again, keeping with the big cat's name for this, which I'm not quite sure where it's come from, um, they chose 34 ICUs across the UK um, and chose patients with septic shock who'd been on a vasopressor infusion for more than um, four hours and gave them 0.1 to 2, 0.2 marks per kilo of levosimendin for 24 hours with a matching placebo. And again... For this, they're measuring a sequential organ failure score. Um, I think trying to suggest that the, that the inadequacy of left ventricular function is contributing to the organ dysfunction in patients with sepsis. Um, and they found, well, at least they measured a whole bunch of things, um, all of which they reported. And I'm sure you can't read any of that. And I really hate it when people put up slides where you can't read any of the stuff. But you can take it from me that there is no difference in any of the clinical outcomes. The only thing that comes close, interestingly, is the, is the difference in the cardiovascular sofa score. And the cardiovascular sofa score is dependent upon the dose of noradrenaline. And that's higher in the levosimendin group, which again is exactly what you would anticipate for a drug that causes vasodilation. So 
of all the things that they found, they found that levosinendid has the pharmacological action that you would expect it to do, but makes no difference to any of the patient-centred outcomes that we see. Um, so, yeah, that's probably about my 10 minutes up. So, I, I would think, what are we going to say about levosinendid? Are you going to love it? Are you going to leave it? I, in a Bayesian sense, I don't think there's information here to change your prior probability. If you already love it, you can continue to use it. It, it probably has the pharmacological action that you would think. If you expect it to be a miracle drug, you probably won't find it. Um, I expect that one of the problems that we're seeing is that heterogeneity is a major barrier to identifying, sorry, a major barrier to identifying um, benefits in these populations. Um, and for a patient having cardiac surgery, it's probably more important that your cardiac surgery team is focusing on the surgery rather than trying to take a selfie. And that's probably <laughs> a more important determinant of your outcome than the supportive care that's... It's probably a more important determinant of outcome than the supportive care that's delivered to you in the perioperative period. And, and the fact that what we do in intensive care is to provide supportive therapy, and prognosis is usually determined by the prognosis of the underlying disease and whether there's any particular treatment that we can be delivered to cure that, much more so than uh, what we can do to support people while it's happening. So thank you very much.